Okay. Let, to, to explain validation a little bit more, and we're going to go deeper into this, I want to talk to you about levels of validation. We'll go through this really quickly. But a low level of validation is, first of all, you're just noticed. Um, and Eva and I were talking about a conference that I got to go to. And if you ever get to go to this conference, it's fantastic. It's the evolution of psychotherapy. Happens, it used to happen every five years. It now happens every, I think, three years, right? So, yeah. And all the greats are at the, the, this conference. I mean, I was just like a little kid, it, it, and these were rock stars. It, it was absolutely amazing. Um, uh, many of you may know Salvador Mnuchin. I, I think he's actually in New York, isn't he? Yeah. Um, and he gave an address to this uh, in this arena, basically, that had appeared to be about 10,000 folks in it. Salvador, um, wonderful, wonderful man, stood up. And he's, uh, to simplify it, I'd just say he's probably considered to be the founder of family therapy, um, at least if not the founder, one of the big greats in family therapy. And he stood up and addressed the crowd and said, um, and this will be my last address. Um, he's in his 80s and he said, I, I, I don't know if I'll make it to the next conference and even if I do, I, I won't be addressing publicly. 10,000 people in the room stood to their feet and gave him a standing ovation. It was really incredibly moving. But I wanted to tell you that story because I got to put this in context. There was another one of the greats that I'm not going to mention because of the story I'm about to tell, but we were all sitting in the ballroom and these ballrooms were huge. I mean, they were, there must have been 10 going on at any given time and they probably seat two or 3,000 people each. Uh, just massive. So you're sitting in this ballroom and here's this one of the greats talking about his work and someone in the audience raises their hand and uh, is persistent and finally he calls on her and, he's, and she says, you know, I came to see you for therapy about three years ago and you fell asleep in my session. <laughs> Those of you who are therapists, it's a nightmare. I mean, I cannot imagine. I have to admit, I have been guilty of um, thinking, you need to pay attention because you just didn't hear what they just said, <laughs> or getting a question and suddenly having to make sure that I'm present because I tuned out, you know. But I've never fallen asleep. I mean, that's kind of like the ultimate invalidation, isn't it? Yeah. So um, anyway, just what he said, well, I hope I sent you a refund. <laughs> she said you did. And the reason why she needed to stand up in a room with 2,000 people and point this out is a whole nother issue. <laughs> But it was interesting, and it really illustrates the point. It is a very low level of validation, but it is incredibly important. And particularly for growing up, and for growing up in an invalidating environment, paying attention, just knowing, acknowledging that someone is there is an important piece of validation. Moderate validation, a moderate level, is another person reflects back to your feeling in a non-judgmental way. Um, it's moderate because <laughs> Those of you, many of you are kind of of the same generation that I was, and when we were trained as therapists, we always watched the tapes of Carl Rogers or someone like Carl Rogers doing therapy, and they would sit there and say, so you're feeling sad. <laughs> and they were just kind of, it was like a parrot. And I can even remember then thinking, really? <laughs> really? You want me to do this? And, and they're going to respond to this? And he would just repeat back over and over again. Because what Carl had found was that that was validating. But what we now understand is that really is a moderate level of validation. The ability to reflect back to someone what they're feeling. Um, when we go into our family systems, the fact that somebody acknowledges your feeling as a child is important. The fact that um, you can be angry and someone can say, it's okay to be angry, but you can't tantrum right now. And it's, I understand you're angry, but you can't sit at the dinner table and throw things, that kind of thing. Just setting limits, but at the same time acknowledging the feeling versus, um, that's silly, you shouldn't be angry about that. Why are you crying? Stop. And it goes even deeper, and it goes deeper particularly for me. And, and um, I share a lot of my life story. I hope you guys are comfortable with that. But it's, it's something that's informed a lot of my life and writing. I grew up in a small town in Louisiana in a Pentecostal family. Um, which has, there's a lot of uh, rigidity around that system, a lot of shame in that system. And there was a right way to feel, you know, and there was a wrong way to feel. And the wrong way to feel took you straight to hell, <laughs> basically. So you had to hope you felt the right way. Of course, as a kid, you didn't feel the right way. So it was always this weird place of trying to twist yourself into a pretzel to feel the right way, even though you knew you felt the wrong way. And so eventually, out of all of that experience, what you learn is that what I feel is wrong. 
that I am flawed because I can't control it. And even though I keep telling myself it's the wrong feeling, it keeps coming up again and again and again. There is something about me that is flawed and unlovable. So it's a moderate level, but an extremely important level of validation. Just acknowledging what you feel and having that reflected back to you. Okay. A high level is you're treated as an equal, not as incompetent, subordinate, fragile, or less than. Again, going back to when I was trained, when many of us were trained, we were sort of trained under this doctor-patient model when we work with patients that uh, I have some answers and you need help and you're going to come to me for that help, right? But what it fundamentally set up was a relationship that was somewhat invalidated because it taught us to teach them to treat our patients as fragile. And we thought that that was being compassionate and loving and caring, and it's not. It's actually incredibly invalidating. If you think of the time that anyone has ever treated you as fragile, like not told you everything that was happening because you couldn't handle it, or because they thought it would be a problem for you, what was your reaction? Usually anger, right? Go to hell. Yeah, go to hell. It's, it's, not, it's not a good feeling at all to have that kind of response. So it is, it is highly validating when somebody treats us as an equal. One of the, just a side note, but those of us that are, that are working in treatment, um, whether we're in a treatment center or in private practice, one of the most effectively validating things that we can do is while at the same time holding really good boundaries is to treat our clients, our patients as equals and to share with them on an, the struggle and the journey on an equal level. And there's a real talent to do that in keeping a good boundary so that you're not, you're not processing your issues or you're not burdening them with, with, with what's going on in your life, but at the same time you're letting them know that you're on the same journey together. So, and the most effective therapists that I've worked with and supervised, I really believe, are the ones that get that, that really get it on a fundamental level, that they connect with their clients as an equal. I'm, you're not less than, we're on the same plane, and we're going to work through this together. Okay, a, a very high level of validation is a person acknowledging and supports your most treasured dreams. Your most treasured dreams. Now, what's interesting about this level of validation is for many folks coming in to treatment, they don't even know what their dreams are. They're at a place where they can't even access them. But when they do, when any of you do, and somebody acknowledges that, it's incredibly meaningful. Um, tell a story, a friend of mine is here, um, like he's, uh, he's done a lot of things in his career. He's um, been a producer, he's been a writer, he's been very successful at it. And, Years ago, um, when Blake and I met, it's been, um, it's been almost 20, well, not quite 20, it's been 16, 17 years ago. Um, we were talking, we happened to meet at a dinner party, he was talking about writing a musical. And I was talking about writing my next book. And what I, what I wanted, this was before Beyond the Looking Glass was actually written and came out. And I remember, the thing I remember from that discussion is that I was able to share my dream with someone who validated it and got it. That it was really important for me to write, that that was an incredibly important dream of mine. When everything in my world was invalidating that, because it's very difficult to get published, as many of you know. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of books, I assume, that are published every year. Very few of them do well. Um, on and on and on and on. I mean, the chatter in your mind can just go continuously about invalidating that. And yet, to sit with someone who says, that is a great idea, and, and let me tell you what I did in my life, and, and to kind of share that moment, it's one of the highest levels of validation that we can give. And when we're children and there's somebody there, for me, there was a psychologist when I was in junior high that uh, was actually a teacher, taught a few courses that actually I was able to connect with and validated me on that level. And I was able to share the dream that I thought maybe one day I'd like to become a psychologist. Very simple, but incredibly powerful and validating. The ability to reflect back to someone that not only you understand their dream, but that it's acceptable. Okay, so invalidation. Um, it's important to kind of look at the other side of this. A low level is others too busy or conflicted to notice you. Moderate, others judge your feelings as insignificant or foolish. High, you're treated as incompetent, subordinate, or fragile. You're made to think that your experience isn't normal. 
and then a very high level of invalidation is your most treasured dreams are ridiculed as foolish. Another person highlights and shames your vulnerability and another threatens your physical safety. The top one, your most treasured dreams are ridiculed as foolish, foolish, incredibly invalidating. And it's, um, it's interesting to me the number of clients that will come in for therapy that have actually been through this from families that are very, very loving and well-intended and supportive in those terms. But because their dream did not fit the dream of the parents, it was incredibly invalidating for them. And the parents only meant for the best. They only meant for the highest for them. They only wanted everything in the world for them. But yet that difference of what I want and what you want for me isn't the same and, and I can't talk about my dream because it doesn't fit with yours is incredibly invalidating and the effect on that can be profound as we'll see later. All right. The invalidating environment, chronically and persistently rejecting a child's communication of private experiences and self-generated behavior by ignoring, punishing, or contradicting such communications. The academic uh, definition that comes out of cognitive treatments for, uh, cognitive therapy for trauma. And there is a growing body of research that links childhood invalidation with emotion dysregulation in children, psychological distress in adulthood. This field is growing. I suspect that it will continue to grow. Um, one of the things that happened that in, in the 90s, 80s, and 90s, the only data that we really were able to use to talk about invalidation was childhood abuse because that was, that was a concrete event that we could take and it was easily measured, right? We could get statistics on childhood abuse and so we could say how prevalent it was and how often it happened. And yet, for many of us, and myself included, I would sit and say, well, I wasn't abused, so it's not relevant to me. You know, I, yeah, I got spanked, and yeah, you know, I got yelled at, and okay, that might have been abuse, but it wasn't like real abuse, you know, at least in my, in my head, it didn't match that. So I wasn't able to connect with that, but what I was able to connect with, really, was when I understand invalidation, because the thing about abuse that doesn't help us as therapists is abuse implies intent. And invalidation doesn't, necessarily. And invalidation often happens without intent to do it. When, when families, when parents are involved in their own divorce and their own conflict, their own situation, unavailable for the kid, they may be very, very well-meaning and very loving, but that can be incredibly invalidating. We wouldn't necessarily consider that abuse, would we? But yet the effects of that can be profound. So I, what I would recommend to you and strongly have you consider is that when you're working with your clients and you're looking at um, issues that maybe traditionally we would have called abuse, it's, it's incredibly helpful to look at them through the lens of invalidation. And I think it's something that more of us can connect to and understand because even when there is significant abuse, um, as, as Alice Miller wrote in her book, Thou Shall Not Be Aware, there's this wall uh, that we put up to naming it as such. And so I think an easier door to walk through sometimes is invalidation. And when there is really significant abuse in the past, you can get there quicker by talking about the invalidation, getting your arms around that, and then going to the place of being able to really own the, the, the real abuse that happened.